Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. I think it's uh, certainly an interesting topic. Um, before I get to all the doom and gloom, and I don't want to disappoint you because I know that's what you're expecting, <laughs> I, th I thought I'd have to at least entertain you a little bit, so let me tell you two jokes. One joke is from the time before the Euro introduction, the other one is uh, from today. And the first joke, I have to apologize, of course, um, that I'm telling it, but it was actually told to me first by an Italian, uh, by an Italian linguistics professor called uh, Stefano Tomizelli. I studied uh, Italy, uh, Italian in Rome in 1997, and that was a joke that he told me, so don't blame me as an arrogant German for that. <clears throat> anyway, the joke goes like this. There is an Italian living in Rome, and he is incredibly frustrated with the state of Italy. Nothing works, everything is dirty, there's corruption everywhere, and he is so frustrated that when he hears that there is a new medical possibility in America, you know, where they freeze people and then wake them up when everything is fine, he says, okay, that's fantastic, that's what I have to do. So he travels over to America and gets really deep frozen and tells his doctor, only wake me up and defrost me when everything in Italy is sorted out and when the country is finally working. So with that instruction, he's lying there for, for decades until one day he's actually defrosted, wakes up and the doctor says, okay, Signore, everything is fine, you're traveling back to Rome now. Oh, he says, fantastic, that's great. So, board says Alitalia plane, a brand new Airbus, <laughs> it's clean, um, the air hostesses are beautiful, the coffee is tasty, everything works, the plane is on time, arrives at Roma Fiumicino airport and is pleasantly surprised because the airport is uh, completely rebuilt, it's glass and steel construction, extremely modern, uh, the baggage carousel work, um, it's um, all extremely efficient, uh, the customs officials are friendly, he's out of the airport in 10 minutes and uh, takes a taxi to Rome city center, brand new Mercedes of course, spotlessly clean, nobody honks, everybody stops at red traffic lights, um, there's no rubbish in the streets, everybody's at work, so it all works, it, it's, it's fine, it's, uh, Italy has completely changed, so he thought, well, hmm better celebrate the new Italy. So he goes to the next bar, orders a bottle of champagne and has a toast to the new Italy. Everything's finally working and he's so happy he takes out his 100,000 liras and puts it on the bar and says to the barman, ah, oh, you keep the rest. To which he looks at him and says, sorry, Signor, it's uh, 100 Deutschmarks now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was <laughs> the expectation in Italy at the time that they would become a bit more German. Now, of course, a joke about the Eurozone goes a little bit different. It's like this, an Italian, a Greek, and a Spaniard go to a bar, each orders a drink, who pays? The German. <laughs> um, so, with that introduction, let me get to my presentation. <laughs> um, Europe is, of course, a continent that's united in uh, stereotypes. And just to give you a few, I don't know who's seen these maps of Europe, but actually I think they tell a story, because the way you look at Europe really depends on your nationality nowadays. If you are Greek, I mean, the rest of Europe looks like the union of stingy, stingy workaholics. If you are Italian, you think the Germans are just clock addicts. If you are um, German, of course, you wouldn't really think much of the rest of Europe, and the best you can say for Greece, for example, that you will find cheap hotels there and vegetables in Poland. If, however, you're Polish, you think that Germany is just a Western bully. But uh, my favorite perspective on Europe is, of course, uh, the United Kingdom perspective, where they just look at the evil continent, the evil federated empire of Europe. <laughs> So that is Europe in stereotypes. It's not quite a united continent, and all these national stereotypes, I think, are, brought, are being brought back to the fore by Europe. What an odd country, right? Have you seen that? Yeah. Okay. Now, but to get more serious now, Europe is, of course, also a continent united, but in debt. And uh, you have probably seen all diagrams where you can see the um, various exposures to European debt by countries. This one is actually taken from the BBC website. They have actually a nice tool that shows exposure to um, international debt, to foreign debt. And without really going through the great details here, the, the um, arrows are actually going from the debtor to the creditor countries. These are just bank debts, and you can see already that there are massive amounts of capital that are um, borrowed between European countries. So there may be a continent united in prejudice, but they're also a continent united in debt. And now, it's of course debt at the public level, public finances that we're talking about, and they are clearly at breaking point. Just to summarize it briefly where we are, these are figures for uh, 2011, what you can see here, this first uh, circle, 
that's the total amount of public debt. Then we have economic growth, and we have budget deficits. And as you can see, this is the euro core. Things are not quite ideal because they are still heavily indebted at 82 and 84 percent, but at least they have some economic growth, and the budget deficits are near more or less okay, although in the case of France, I mean, 5.8 percent, I would still call that excessive. <laughs> but then look at what happens in the crisis countries. And Government debt is certainly out of control in Greece. It is out of control in Italy. Ireland doesn't look great and it is growing fast. Um, Spain is still below German levels because they um, actually had some nice surplus budgets in the early years of the century. But Portugal, again, 100% debt to GDP doesn't look quite stable. But I think what's more frightening here is the debt dynamics because in all of these countries you can see that they are running massive budget deficits. And unfortunately, their economies are, not, are going nowhere. I mean, Italy hasn't really had any real growth for about a decade now, and Greece is heavily contracting, so they've got no chance of getting this figure under control. The European Union Commission is now expecting that next year, sometime next year, Greece may even reach 200% debt to GDP, so these countries are clearly bankrupt. Now, the thing is, of course, it was never meant to be this way. Um, the Europeans are currently talking about a new stability pact, but um, they are forgetting that they already have one. And this pact was uh, quite clear. It was the Maastricht rules, the Maastricht Treaty, and they said uh, that countries were not allowed to run deficits higher than 3%, and uh, total debt to GDP should not exceed 60%. Now, of course, over the first 10 years of monetary union, this is from the European Central Bank, nobody really played by these rules. So you had, for example, Germany running massive budget deficits in the early years of the century. Same is true for, Fra for France. And uh, these countries were not punished for that at the time. And also, countries were allowed to get into the Eurozone at much higher debt levels, not just Greece. Think of Belgium. And even Germany was slightly above what was permitted. And certainly, that was also true for Italy and um, for, for Greece, as I said, it didn't take uh, fiddling with the figures. So debt problems are severe in Europe, and we all know this by now, but that is clearly not the only problem. I would say that European countries got uh, more diverse under the euro, not less, and it was never the plan, of course. It was always a plan that uh, under the stability and growth pact, European countries would uh, enter a period of uh, convergence. But it hasn't quite happened that way. And one of the indicators that, uh, that shows it quite, nice, quite nicely what happened is inflation. So here we have the inflation deviation from the Eurozone average in different countries. And as you can see, in the core, inflation was usually a little bit below, with the exception of the Netherlands, for a period of time. And the other countries, I don't know, the crisis countries, so Spain, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, were always running inflation rates that were slightly above, or quite substantially actually above, the European average, the Eurozone average. So you can see that there is no convergence. It's actually these countries are growing further apart. Um, that is also reflected then in current account imbalances. And it is quite interesting. Now everybody's talking about German economic strength and Germany's um, strong um, export sector. But until the introduction of the Eurozone, uh, of the Euro, Germany was a relatively balanced country with regard to its current account balance. And it's only after the introduction of the euro that Germany became such a super competitive country, benefiting from a, a low exchange rate and actually reforming itself also, whereas the other countries um, were going much into this deficit, ter deficit, deficit territory and they now have to recover from that. So these are current account imbalances, of course, as measured as a percentage of GDP. Now, we also have a balance of payments crisis. And I think this graph uh, is quite frightening, although most people have probably never heard of this. There is a payment system that was uh, established a few years ago in all EU member states. It's called Target 2. It's a bank transfer mechanism, and it would probably be uh, asked too much to explain this in two minutes. But basically what happens is that in 2007, capital markets were no longer prepared to fund periphery countries, and therefore the uh, bank transfers and interbank lending completely dried up and central banks actually had to fill the gap. So central banks kept on financing the trade deficits in the periphery. And so in this way, the German Bundesbank has accumulated a total claims position against the euro system of now 465 billion euros. That was never meant to go up anywhere. I mean, under a normal system, it was always supposed to hover around the zero um, billion mark. But uh, basically, Germany over the past uh, four years has kept the trade imbalances party in Europe going, and now they're sitting on these claims that they will probably never recover. The um, 
problem with all of this is if you look at the target balances, these claims against the Eurozone, um, this is, uh, from August, September 2011. In the meantime, it has already gone up, as I said, to 465. You have a few creditor countries now under that system. Germany is the biggest one. Apart from that, there's Luxembourg, there are the Netherlands, and then there is Finland. But all the other countries are running, running massive imbalances, de deficits under the target system. And uh, the complication is that if you want to correct these balances, it's going to be extremely expensive. And for any of these debtor countries leaving, it would mean that the Germans are taking 27% of that because they're taking the losses according to their share of the European Central Bank's subscribed capital. So that's uh, quite an annoyance to the Germans, um, because if Greece, for example, departs, they have to take 27% of that. That means the Germans will have to write down 26 billion euros on their central bank's balance sheet, and the German Bundesbank would have to be recapitalized by the German taxpayer. Now, 26 billion is quite a substantial sum of money. The Germans could probably still take that. But what if Germany departs? If Germany departs, they probably have to recapitalize the whole of the Bundesbank balance sheet because no other country is willing to settle their balance with Germany anymore. How can you recapitalize the Bundesbank to the tune of about half a trillion euros? Forget it. Um, then there are competitiveness divergences. So we have seen in the past 10 years that um, <coughs> some countries have um, been on uh, enormous wage increases year on year whereas the Germans were actually trying to uh, go through uh, wage moderation. The German trade unions were, were for a change quite sensible, um, and the Germans uh, tried to reform the labor market timidly, but at least they tried. And the result of all of this is that Germany became more and more competitive over time. So relative unit labor costs in Germany are now below their level uh, that they were in, at two in 2000, whereas other countries um, are now far higher than they were in 2000. So that also means that if these periphery countries that we're always talking about, so Italy, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Ireland, want to regain competitiveness with Germany, well, then um, they have to in increase their productivity by quite substantially, or they would have to cut wages. Or they would have to devalue their currency, which they can't because they're trapped in the Eurozone. And this is what's making reforms in Italy now so difficult, because how can you explain to the Italians, for example, that they have to take a 30% pay, pay cut just in order to regain their competitiveness position with Germany in 2000. So there are quite a few common misunderstand misunderstandings about the euro crisis. I mean, one of them is that the euro crisis uh, was not triggered by the GFC. That's what European leaders believe. They thought that without the GFC, everything would have been fine, and it's just because some markets are not panicking um, that the euro doesn't work anymore. But I would say that the euro never quite worked. Um, it didn't work well prior to the GFC. Because, first of all, that stability and growth pact was ineffective from the beginning, as you have seen earlier, because they never played by the rules. And European countries were never synchronized, as you could have also seen um, in the trade imbalances, as you could have seen in uh, productivity records, in uh, unit labor costs. You could also see it quite practically if you looked at uh, the experience of um, Spain and Ireland in the early years of the century when they were going through um, property booms and Germany was in a slump. So. The euro never quite worked for the whole eurozone. The countries were never synchronized. And there were, of course, symptoms of relative economic decline in European countries for decades. I find it quite astonishing when you're really looking at, um, for example, things like the Lumsdorff paper. That was the document that ended the German coalition in 1982. And uh, Lumsdorff, the then economics minister, um, basically tried to come up with a list of things that Germany really needs to tackle urgently in order to regain competitiveness with the rest of the world. And none of these reforms have been tackled. They've had 30 years for that. And it's the same story in Italy. I mean, when was the last time that an Italian government really started reforming the country? I mean, Monti is really probably the first in decades. So nothing was done about this. And it really, it is not just an economic crisis. It is really a crisis of monetary union, but it's a crisis also of the political framework of the European Union that doesn't work anymore. We have now increasing divisions between Euro and non-Euro EU members, most uh, definitely between Britain and the rest, because Britain is, of course, afraid that um, measures to solve or tackle the Eurozone crisis will involve uh, stricter regulations for the city of London. So this is really driving uh, EU member states apart. We have a clear division now between the core European countries, core Euro countries, and the periphery Euro countries. That is quite clear now in the um, divisions between Germany and Greece, for example, or Germany and Ireland, or Germany and Italy, and you just have to read uh, the Greek or Italian or Irish press to see how Angela Merkel is now being portrayed quite regularly in these countries. 
But I think we also have to say that in Europe there is simply a lack of global awareness. They still believe that they are running the show internationally. They have perhaps heard of India and China, but uh, they certainly don't really think that it means anything for how they are behaving. And you just have to look at how Europeans are acting at climate change summits where they really think they can tell the world what to do. They simply don't get it that they are now the problem and they, are, they don't have the answers. And the world is not waiting for Europe actually to tell them what to do. Anyway, the euro crisis is difficult because we are not really talking about just one euro crisis. I think, as I have shown you in the um, slides before, there are four different but, of course, connected euro crises. The first crisis is obviously the public debt crisis that everybody is talking about, and it is mainly a debt crisis in the periphery, although I would argue that the core countries are not nearly as healthy as they believe. Um, a country with 82% debt like Germany I mean, you can really have doubts whether it should be AAA rated. And what Standard & Poor's said today, um, I think, just underlines that. Then we have a competitiveness crisis in the European periphery. So this is because of the cost differentials. This is because of the lack of uh, productivity-enhancing reforms for decades in the periphery countries. They can't keep up with Germany. Germany um, tried to reform itself. It has kept wages relatively low. German real wages haven't gone up for a decade, whereas uh, they exploded in the periphery countries, and therefore there is a severe competitiveness problem in the European periphery. Then, of course, there is a banking crisis. We all know now that European banks are hopelessly undercapitalized. They are not able to absorb any of the shocks from uh, a sovereign default in Europe. And that is a banking crisis, I think, that is present in both the core and the periphery. And on top of that, we've got the balance of payments crisis, that is simply the drying up of interbank lending between the core and the periphery, and European central banks, the euro system, jumping in to make up for that. But eventually, this will have to be solved, because you can't let this target to imbalance um, go on indefinitely. I think 465 billion is quite extreme already. I can't imagine it going any further. So the problem with all of this is that European politicians are currently trying to solve just one crisis. They are trying it with the public debt crisis. But you really need to tackle all of these crises at once if you want to have a chance to save Europe. But European leaders, and I lose this term extremely loosely here, um, they are really only talking about the debt crisis. You just have to listen to Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy in their statement yesterday, and it's all about fiscal rules. It is all about stability. It is all trying to impose austerity on Greece and Italy. And they're never talking about the other problems. They're never talking about the competitiveness issues in Greece. They're never talking about the, ba uh, the banking crisis, apart from their vague plan to um, increase the uh, tier one core capital. They're not talking about the balance of payments crisis. I actually think that most European politicians have never heard of it. And so they are not getting anywhere near a solution because they're only trying one. They're only trying this bit. They're not even getting this bit right. And they have completely forgotten about the rest. And so this makes it difficult to actually forecast where Europe is going and the next moves in the Eurozone crisis, because it is a political union, it's a political project. And if it had been for economic advice, the Euro would have, been, would have never been introduced. There were enough economists at the time warning against the introduction of uh, the Euro. And it was pretty clear that this was going to be a very ambitious project, to say the least, to try to introduce monetary union without political union, without the necessary institutional framework. But because it was introduced against economic advice, it may now stay alive also against economic advice. But the problem is, of course, that the costs of saving uh, the cur currency have now become so high that a total coll collapse looks possible now and probably even unavoidable. Because uh, if the euro fails, it will not fail for lack of political will. I think there's all the political will in the world, or at least in Europe, to save the euro. But they simply can't afford it anymore. And you just have to keep in mind that we are talking about refinancing needs for the PICS countries, so Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, plus Belgium, for the next uh, two years of more than a trillion euros. And they simply don't have the money. Nobody's willing to lend it to them anymore. And even all of these nice rescue funds and stability mechanisms and stability financial stability facilities do not have enough capital to deal with that. The European Financial Stability Facility has guarantees of 780 billion euros. That means it has a lending cap capacity, an effective lending capacity of 440 because the EFSF wants to maintain its AAA rating. So they can't go to the full 780 billion. But um, 
this is all pretty much a fiction. This is a scam because nobody's going to lend to the EFSF anymore. And by the way, who guarantees that EFSF again? Well, here it is. That's the EFSF structure. It's uh, quite simple. You have 780 billion euros in guarantees given by the 17 eurozone countries. So every country guarantees a bit. But what happens is, of course, that as soon as a country needs money, they are no longer guaranteeing because, I mean, that would be a complete absurdity, of course, if Greece started to guarantee its own debt. So they're taking off. And so that's happened already. So from the original 780 billion, we only have 726 billion left in guarantees, not in cash, to remember, because uh, Greece received money not from the ESF, EFSF, but from a separate um, package. And then uh, Portugal and Ireland also received money. But you can already see what's going to happen if Italy needs support. Uh, if Italy needs support, its guarantees will be reduced to zeros. And so will this figure go down. So just under 600 billion eventually. So you can see that there is not enough cash in this fund. And in the end, it will probably be up to Germany to save Europe, because all the other countries will be bankrupt before Germany. But even Germany can't save the world, neither does it want to. So the EFSF is really a scam. Um, the EFSF is certainly too small to absorb Italy. Italy needs to refinance 305 billion euros next year. They need to raise 40 billion euros alone in February next year, at the time of the, of the Greek election. So that will be interesting to watch. And the problem is that the spread now between EFSF debt and the still AAA rated German and French debt is widening. And um, this was never meant to be this way, because EFSF debt was supposed to be as safe, as stable as German and French debt. But uh, the EFSF now has to pay quite a premium compared to German bunds. So that was not meant to happen. Apart from that, the EFSF finds it increasingly difficult to place its debt. And the last time they tried it, uh, two, three weeks ago, from what I heard, um, European central banks bought up most of it. So um, private investors don't trust the EFSF anymore, and I think they shouldn't. So it's central banks now jumping in. Um, so I think it is quite difficult, if not impossible, for the EFSF to increase its firepower to the desired trillion euros. And actually, even the trillion euros may not be enough. Um, two, three months ago, we started speculating that the EFSF might eventually need two or three trillion euros. Um, they quickly realized that that was completely unachievable and then reduced it to a trillion euros at the last summit. But even that, I think, is difficult to get because nobody's going to lend to them anymore. So this leaves three theoretical alternatives for the euro. You can dissolve it, you can move towards full fiscal union, or you can monetize the debt, which means print the debt through European Central Bank quantitative easing. Um, but the problem with these three solutions is that none of them really works, because the French would block that. Dissolving the euro is completely out of question for France, because they have put a lot of political capital in, into the European project, and uh, they still want to control somehow what happens in Germany. And if they are standing outside Germany, if they're being separated from Germany, the French believe they would lose a lot of influence, so they will try everything to keep it alive. Then you can move towards fiscal union. The Germans will say nine to this. Now, of course, some of you may have heard Angela Merkel talking about fiscal union, but what she means is something completely different. She doesn't mean fiscal union. She doesn't mean transfers of cash from Germany to other countries. What she means is really just German control over other countries. But that's not fiscal union. Uh, that's uh, German surveillance. <laughs> and then, of course, you can monetize the debt. But again, this is verboten. So you can't go there either. Actually, this is verboten under the European treaties. This is also for verboten under um, German constitutional law. And actually, fiscal union is also verboten under German constitutional law. The German constitutional court had a number of uh, decisions recently on the euro, and um, they made it pretty clear, Germany's, Germany's highest judges, that Germany cannot move towards fiscal union without breaching its own constitution. So the only chance that Germany has, according to the president of Germany's constitutional court, if it wants to move towards fiscal union, is to have a new constitution. Now, getting a new constitution is a bit tricky, of course, even in Germany. Uh, it would require a referendum. And what are the chances that the Germans would say yes to a new constitution in a referendum only to pay to Greece? OK, enough said. So the end game. I think Greece will eventually realize that it's much better off outside the European Union or outside the Eurozone, at least, because they can see now that all of the austerity measures that are implemented by the Greek government, or at least the Greek government is trying to implement them, don't work because uh, um, economic growth in Greece is abysmal. 
uh, unemployment is 20 percent. Uh, youth unemployment in Greece is 50 percent. So despite all of these harsh austerity measures, it doesn't work. Greece is getting nowhere out of this. So why wouldn't they leave? On the other hand, Germany might pull out because the Germans, of course, have uh, quite an aversion to money printing and fiscal union. They think that they took um, no wage increases for a decade. So why should they then, on top of that, pay for their productivity and for their efficiency? So they might pull out. But in any case, whoever leaves first will set a precedent for others. So if Greece leaves, why should, stay, why should Portugal stay in? And conversely, if Germany leaves, why should the Finns stay in or the Dutch or the Austrians? So I think this may well trigger a chain reaction. And the real question then is whether the European Union as such survives monetary disintegration. And I think it would be a pity if it didn't survive, at least as a free trade zone. I mean, the European Union is certainly not ideal, but at least it facilitated the free movement of capital people um, and services and goods. So I think that would be um, disastrous if that also uh, dissolved. In any case, I think that the, Europe, the Euro, European Monetary Union, was a flawed experiment from the very beginning. And it will fail because of all its inherent contradictions. Many of them were actually forecast, predicted by economists at the time. And uh, how it's going to happen, I don't know, but I have a feeling that the Eurozone will not stay alive for the next 12 months. And yet, and now, that's a matter for discussion. Thank you.